Welcome students. I welcome you on the behalf of Tone Academy, a host, the best faculty uh, with almost two, three decades of experience and all the students who wanted to learn the concepts and the application part. Even though you have several other sources, I think you can bank on Tone Academy and T1 channel because uh, we'll be seriously taking through the entire uh, the subject points along with the concepts and we will have the access of also clearing doubts and you can actually bank on us. You can actually bank on us, sit, relax and follow the sequence. We, we will be following the sequence and we will be actually lecturing what is important for you for your immediate exams or even for your knowledge through our content delivery. And this is Chandrasekhar Vadlamani which I will be teaching chemistry for you and please follow me. Uh, we were dealing from the previous classes basically uh, we are dealing with atomic structure. The very first class I was telling about the dual nature of light. The second we went to the photoelectric effect. Then I was telling the Einstein's view on the photoelectric effect. And when we were dealing with each subtopic, I think I was writing what are the questions that will be coming in your JE mains, NEET or any pre-engineering test or pre-medical test. That's what we are exactly doing. What, what do we do is we first get into the subtopic. Then once we finish the subtopic, then I would like to pinpoint and you can bank on those questions which will be coming in the exam. That is how the sequence is. So I appeal all to, to all the students to follow the sequence of a particular lesson and of a particular subtopic such that you can actually bank on all the questions which will be coming in the exam. You must understand. And in the process, in the last class, I think you might be following me, we were discussing about Bohr's atomic model, very quick review of that. See, the proposal of NRP, the non-radiating paths for electrons around the nucleus, has been real merit of what? Bohr. If you ask me what is the merit of Bohr, the introduction of the principal quantum number, the introduction of principal quantum number itself is a merit. When I say introduction of the principal quantum number, that means that introduction of the shell, introduction of the orbit or introduction of the non-radiating path, all are synonymous, you must understand. That itself is a merit and it's designated by an integer which is called principal quantum number. That is how it is designated. That's the first thing. Second thing which cropped up is where does the light come from? See, when you are proposing non-radiating paths, people will naturally ask you where is the light coming from? The light is coming from the atom, that obviously you know, but how do you actually reconcile and give the explanation? That is the issue, right? So what Bohr was telling is, since I said my NRPs are constant, having, having constant energy, you cannot change my electron's energy in any of my NRP. If that is the case, and if an electron from a higher orbit wanted to revolve in the lower orbit, then it has to vomit that excess of energy that is present in that electron, then you can revolve in the NRP, that's what Bohr was telling. What we will do, we will put to test, we will put to test this Bohr's model uh, to a single electron systems. When I say single electron systems, that means system is a part of environment under focus, under study, under observation. That's what is the technical word is, right? So we wanted to apply this Bohr's model to single electron systems and there is no better single electron system than the hydrogen atom itself. Right? So what we are supposed to do is take a sample of hydrogen gas. Now I write the sequence for you. Now look at this. You take a hydrogen gas sample and when you take this, you have hydrogen gas molecules. You don't find ready-made hydrogen atoms because hydrogen atoms are unstable. They are unstable. They will readily combine giving you hydrogen molecules. You must understand that. Right? So what we are supposed to do is take a hydrogen gas sample right? You have hydrogen molecules in it. Then what you do, you expose this to, expose this to thermal heat. You expose this to thermal heat. Then what I'm trying to do is I'm breaking the molecules into atoms. Now when you take a sample of gas, when you take a sample of gas, it has infinite, uh, not infinite, you have many number of what? Molecules. So when you're breaking it to, into atoms, I think you find now many number of what? Atoms, right? So what I'm doing is since you don't find hydrogen atoms, I have taken a hydrogen gas, right? And it has hydrogen gas molecules and I'm exposing this to thermal heat. Then they are breaking into hydrogen atoms and now you have hydrogen atoms in place then what we are supposed to do is all these hydrogen atoms that are present they will be now absorbing the energy absorbing the energy now the now you must understand it's a common sense that since you have many hydro, hydrogen atoms available all these hydrogen atoms will be actually absorbing energy in different quanta 
not every hydrogen atom will be absorbing the same amount of energy. If someone is absorbing one H nu, quanta is nothing but H nu, right? That's Planck's quantum theory, if you can recollect, right? So if, if, if two bodies are exchanging energy, they will be doing in form of quanta. That means you will absorb one H nu or two H nu or three H nu or four H nu. You cannot absorb half H nu or three by four H nu. You must understand. That's what is called quantization. You must understand that. So once you have this hydrogen atom, so many hydrogen atoms that are now dissociated, the molecules are dissociated into hydrogen atoms, all these hydrogen atoms are now in the process of absorbing heat. Now when they are in the process of absorbing heat, they are absorbing in different quanta. Now when they absorb in different quanta, then what happens, the lone electron that is present in the hydrogen atom is now rising to excited states excited what shells you must understand because earlier in ground state of hydrogen atom the electron is in the first orbit now when you're absorbing energy the electron is actually rising into higher energy levels and you have infinite number of hydrogen levels in any what uh, infinite number of energy levels in any any atom you must understand you have infinite number of what energy levels so what these hydrogen atoms are doing is these are actually absorbing heat in terms of quanta they will absorb 1H nu, 2H nu, 3H nu, 4H nu, right? Each one will be absorbing in a different quanta. And the lone electron which is present is now rising to the excited state. Depending upon the amount of heat, you are basically what? Absorbing. Now what happens? Now, wh what is happening here? There are two processes which are going on. Well, I would like to call there are two processes. The process of absorption and this I call, the, the, the consequence of this is going in for excited states. Going in for excited states. The excitation process has started because you are absorbing uh, uh, different quanta of heat. This lone electron is now rising to the excited state. Now as I told you, this excitation won't be forever. It will be for 10 power minus 8 seconds. It is so less time. Have a feel of it. Even if it's less than the blink of an eye within span of 10 power minus 8 seconds or the electron which is risen to the higher energy levels will fall back. And within this, you will find de-excitation happening. De-excitation happening. So, simultaneously with a small, small uh, time interval, very small interval of 10 power minus 8 seconds, the excitation and the de-excitation process will start and for the observer it, it seems to be confusing because the fellow who is actually seeing there is excitation going on by absorbing energy and there is de-excitation also going on at the same time you must understand this right now when this process happens excitation and de-excitation has started what I will do what I will do as I told you as I told you you have different you have many number of what atoms you have many number of atoms and in every atom the excitation has happened and every atom you have the de-excitation happening, right? What I am interested is from which energy level you have gone, I am not interested in that, right? I am more interested in which energy level you are coming back within a gap of what, 10 power minus 8 seconds. In the process, last time I told you that, you know, you, in, in some of the atoms, the electron might be risen to the seventh energy level, right? And it might straightly fall back to what, the first energy level, right? So in one of the atoms, if you see 7 to 1, 6 to 1, 5 to 1, and you know, 4 to 1, and 3 to 1, and 2 to 1. So I'm basically interested to which energy level the de-excitation is taking place, right? It's not happening in one atom, mind you. This should be clear. It's not happening in one atom. It's happening in several atoms, in several atoms. And in several atoms, what I'm trying to do is group. I wanted to group it and when I'm grouping it, there must be some basis. That basis, I will reveal it to you in a sh sh very shortly. Now, what I'm doing is from all these energy levels, it's actually jumping into the first energy level. I have grouped all the jumps to the first energy level. I have actually uh, grouped all the jumps to the second energy level, third energy level, fourth energy level and fifth energy level. So, they, they, when I'm grouping something, there must be some basis and on that basis, it really surprising to me, uh, it really great observation done by people right so simply speaking simply speaking before I go in for the energy level diagram for you remember this I have taken hydrogen gas it has molecules and I expose this to thermal heat right and the hydrogen atoms are now the hydrogen molecules have grow, broken into hydrogen atoms and they are absorbing H nu Right? It might be H nu, 2 H nu, 3 H nu. Depending on how much energy you have absorbed, you get into an excited state 
and within a span of 10 power minus 8 seconds you get de excited right i am more interested in to which energy level basically you are jumping and i am not interested in which energy level you have gone so in that process i am grouping all the jumps to the first all the jumps to the second all the jumps to the third and when i am grouping it i think i have some basis right now what i will do is basically draw a energy level diagram for you and then here are some of the observations which are great and lovely watch watch here watch here See this. See this. What I will do, if I see, if I see this is the first energy level, n is equal to 1. See, this, you, you need to understand this way, you know, this is the first energy level, which I'm drawing it as a line, and look into the second energy level. This is the second energy level, right? n is equal to 2. Now, if I go for n is equal to 3, I'm very consciously reducing the gap, and I draw the attention of everyone. And I draw the attention of everyone. Remember, I don't, you don't think that I don't have a pen and a scale such that I can have a uh, equal spacing between them. There is a rationale behind it. There is some rationale behind this. You must understand this, right? This is the first energy level. This is the second energy level. And this is the third energy level. And look into the fourth one now. Very consciously, I will reduce the gap. That's the fourth energy level. And if I go for the fifth energy level, n is equal to 5. And this is how it is further reducing and the sixth one further reduces and the seventh one is almost merging with this almost merging with this you must understand it's not that i don't have a pen and a pencil you must understand this so if i can redraw this again for you because it's merging so remember that the gaps are very much conscious don't think that i don't have a uh, something to measure there is a rational which I would like to calculate and tell it to you look into this this is the first energy level this is the first energy level n is equal to 1 this is the second energy level look at the gap look at the gap I would like to actually tell you and calculate why this huge gap is for you don't think that you know uh, there are no equal spacings just like that or something like that there is a rational why we don't have what uh, you know spaces equally and look into this, this is n is equal to 3, the space further decreased. This is n is 3. And look into this, look into this, n is equal to 4, 4, this is further decreased, n is equal to 4. And this is the 5, it has further decreased, 5, 5. And this is the 6, and I'm drawing it 6, 6, 6. And the 7 is almost merging with this. And the 7 is almost merging with this, you must understand, right? So this is 4, this is 5, then this is 6, and this is 7. That's how it is. If you go beyond 7, the 7 is actually merging with 8. And if you go beyond 8, 8 is merging with 9, 10, 11, you are unable to distinguish anything. Now, let, let's come to this question, why there are unequal spacings here? Why there are unequal spacings here? I can draw equal spacings, but I'm not doing it. And I'm doing it, I've drawn this very consciously. And if you want to explain to someone, and someone is asking me, why are you not drawing equal spaces? Because these are energy levels. And look into this, what I'm doing. We have an equation for the NRP that is En is equal to minus 13.6 by N square electron volts. If you wanted to find the energy of any of these energy levels, you have an equation. You have an equation. If I find out even, if I find out even, that is minus 13.6 electron volts. If I find E2, that is minus 3.5 electron volts. If I find E3, which is minus 1.5 electron volts, that is how it is. Watch. This is, you just substitute n is equal to 1. If you substitute n is equal to 2. If you substitute n is equal to 3. These are the values you are getting. Now, if you look into this, this E2 minus E1, E2 minus E1, the energy difference, if you actually see, it is plus 10 electron volts. Plus 10.2 electron volts. It is approximately plus 10.2 electron volts. You must understand. Right? And if you wanted to get into this E3 minus E2, then it is actually plus 2 electron volts. You must understand. Right? And if you are actually going for E4 minus E3, it further decreases. It further decreases. So remember two things which I wanted to write here. And I wanted to write here. As you move, I draw the attention, please. I draw the attention of everyone. Watch carefully. This is, this is basically the thing you must be understanding because this might be a question in the exam also, right? So which of the following is true? That might be the question in the exam. A theoretical question. Which of the following is true? This is true. That, you know, on moving from the first energy level to the higher energy levels, the energy of the orbit is increasing. 
the energy of the orbit is increasing that's no doubt right but the energy difference if you actually see the energy difference the energy difference e2 minus e1 or e3 minus e2 or e4 minus e3 it's actually decreasing and let me tell you that even if you see the energy difference if i put it to be delta e if i put it to delta e the delta e tends to zero the energy difference bed between them tends to zero so remember remember this is a critical point which every student must understand first of all if you look into any textbook or any any spectra which is drawn with respect to hydrogen you can actually see the energy spaces are not equal they are not equal they are not equal and they have drawn very consciously because they are of course not equal so what is the truth behind it is basically understand as you move from the lower energy levels to the higher energy levels the energy of the orbit will be increasing the energy of the orbit will be increasing but at the same time the energy difference that is e2 minus e1 or e3 minus e2 or delta e this tends to zero so if you go beyond seven and wanted to write eight the spacing is almost this is itself is eight that itself is eight and if you go for nine that itself is nine that itself is 9. If you go for 10, that itself is 10. So the spacing is almost decreasing and it's tending to 0. I never said delta E is 0. It's tending to 0. So for the observer, it's actually, he finds that this become a band after 7. If you see, after the 7th energy level, it's almost like a band. A band where each line is merging with the other line. When lines are merging with one another, we call it to be a band. So for the observer, it seems to be, it seems to be a band spectra type after 7th energy level for the simple reason because the delta E tends to 0. You must understand. So from now onwards, when you are actually opening the textbook, if you look into the hydrogen spectra, and if you wanted to ask your teacher why there are no equal spacings, why they don't have a pen and a pencil? No, absolutely not. It's based on this calculation where the energy equation is given like this and you can see that the delta E is tending to zero. You must understand that's why we don't have equal spacings while doing the energy levels you must understand right now coming to the hydrogen spectra assume now what i said there is excitation gone the electron has gone the lone electron which is present in the hydrogen has gone to the higher energy levels and it starts coming back now it's not happening in one atom mind you i have not taken an atom in my hand which is impossible right now what we have done is we have to have n number of hydrogen atoms and in each atom the de-excitation process has started in some of them, the jump is from 2 to 1, the other is from 3 to 1, the other is from 4 to 1, the other is from 5 to 1, 6 to 1, 7 to 1. So I'm interested from where you're jumping, I'm not interested from to which energy level you are jumping, that I'm grouping it. And when I'm grouping it, there must be some basis because what happens is in your school, someone is grouping you for a particular section, then I think you should be, you should be of the same height or color or you should be a sports person or you must be intelligent or you should be, you must be a stupid for a room area remedial class or whatever there should be some basis just like that you can't group it right and wow, what is surprising here now I group it this is the seventh energy level to the first energy level right and this is the sixth energy level to the first energy level you must understand right and fifth to the first energy level right and then you have from from fourth to the first energy level third to the first energy level and the second to the first energy level now watch carefully here all the jumps in several atoms, you know, not one atom, mind you, this, this is a perception of a student which we must clarify. All this is happening not in a single atom. You have many atoms where the de-excitation is process is going on and I'm interested to which energy level it is jumping and all the jumps to the first are recorded, are recorded. And look into this, all the jumps to the first energy level, I'm recording it. And if you look into Bohr's theory, when an electron jumps from higher orbit to lower orbit, you must vomit that excess of energy. You cannot bring all your energy in the second orbit and put it in the first orbit into my pocket. It never happens. The excess energy must be vomited. And the reason for that, because the energy of the orbit is constant. You cannot bring all your energy and add it to the first energy level because the first energy level remains constant. That's why Bohr received Nobel Prize because it's a non-radiating part. The energy of a particular orbit is constant. So if an electron is bored in the seventh energy level and wanted to come to the first energy level, the energy, the excess energy which the electron possesses must be vomited. And the vomiting in the, is in the form of light. 
and the light when it vomits according to Planck's quantum theory it's done in a discontinuous fashion in form of what quanta and we have energy equations you must understand this is nothing but e is equal to h nu so when you're actually jumping the light is actually given out the light is actually given out right and when the light is given out each jump is recorded uh, you know this is lambda 1 this has a wavelength. Now, how do you speak the language of uh, light? Light has parameters. There is a frequency and wavelength. So if you wanted to speak the language of a wave, you must speak in terms of what wavelength and what frequency. And when there is a jump from 7 to 1, the light is emitted, which has a lambda 1 as the wavelength. And this has lambda 2, and this is lambda 3, and this is lambda 4, and this is lambda 5. Mind you that when the light is actually emitted, it is actually passing through the slit of a spectrophotometer. The light which is emitted is actually passing through a slit of a spectrophotometer. Then this light which is emitted is actually going through a slit, a rectangular slit of a spectrophotometer. Then lines appear, you must understand. This is how the line spectra looks like. This is the line uh, of the 7 to 1 jump which has a wavelength of lambda 1. And then you have the spacing again, this is lambda 2. And the spacing here also decreases. Here also decreases, mind you that. And this is lambda 3. And the spacing further decreases, lambda 4. And this is lambda 5. And this is lambda 6. And this lambda 7. And if you go beyond 7, I think each line is, each line is actually merging with the line. And for the observer, this is a critical point. You must understand. And I draw the attention of students again. Watch. Now what happens is still 7 for the observer, it seems to be a discontinuous spectra. That means discontinuous spectra in earlier classes, I was telling you that you have well-defined lines. When I say well-defined lines, the line uh, parameters, the, the parameters of the particular line uh, of the light which is emitted in the form of what? Wave. It has lambda which is very clear. The value is very, 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 very distinct and clear. Right? If you go beyond 7, the 7 is merging with 8, 8 is merging with 9. So for the observer, what he is feeling is basically after 7, you are actually having a uh, what, continuous spectra because it looks like a band. Look at this. This is 7 and this is 8, this is 9 and this is 10, that itself is 11, that itself is 12, that itself is 13, like that infinite. So for the observer, till 7th energy level, you can actually have a well-defined lines. Beyond that, I think each line is merging with the other because the energy difference is basically decreasing and the delta E is actually becoming what? Zero. You must understand. Now, why did I group? As I said, as I said, I wanted to group all the jumps to the first and there should be some basis for your grouping. Now, what I observed is, in fact, I get surprised when I actually see this. I get surprised because the grouping is done and the surprising factor which emerged out of this is all these lines, all these jumps from higher energy levels to the first energy level are basically falling in ultraviolet region. They are actually falling in ultraviolet region and this was observed and named after a scientist. This is called Lyman series. This is basically called what? Lyman series, you must understand that. So I told you there must be some basis. What is surprising is I've grouped all the lines to the first energy level and they are all falling in ultraviolet region. And if you wanted to have a recap of how, what exactly is an ultraviolet region, you have a spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. You must understand the visible region which you and me can see. The visible region which you and me can see, that is ranging between 3800 to 7600 angstroms. Right? That is the range where you and me can see. You and me can see. Be less than that you can't see. Greater than that you can't see. So less than this you can say your ultraviolet region. Greater than that we call this to be infrared region. You must understand that. Right? Less than this is UV. Greater than that is IR. And beyond that you have your microwaves. And finally ends with what? Microwaves is your electromagnetic what? Spectrum. So understand that all these lambdas, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, lambda 5, they are all falling in ultraviolet region where the wavelengths are less than what? The visible region that is 3800 angstrom units, that is a minimum. And they are falling in ultraviolet region with a lambdas which are less than 3800. That's why this was observed by what? Lyman. And I always wanted to point out, I always wanted to point out that this is not happening in a single atom. This is not happening in a single atom. 
This has n number of atoms, excitation is taking place, de excitation is taking place, and I am interested uh, not in the excitation, but to where it is de getting de excited. And here in this case, it is the first energy level, and we call this to be ultraviolet region, and we call this to be Lyman series because it is named after the scientist that is Lyman. Similarly, I think you can see all the jumps to two. This is two, all the jumps to two, all the jumps to two, all the jumps to two. Right, and this falls in visible region. This is falling in visible region. You and me can see. You and me can see with our naked eye. So this is visible region, and this is named after a scientist, which is Bama, which is Bama. That is ultraviolet region. You must understand that, right? And that is to the two. And similarly, you have jumps uh, to the three, to the three. And remember, and this falls in. Uh, this is ultraviolet, that is Bama, and this is, this is falling in infrared region. You must understand this. Infrared region and uh, to the, all the jumps to the first energy level, the second energy level. And I'm surprised that all the jumps to the first are falling in one common region. That's ultraviolet region. And then it's named after Lyman because the observation was made by him. Similarly, all the jumps to the second is made by Bama. And that is nothing but the visible region where you and me can see. And then coming... Uh, all the jumps to the third, all the jumps to the third, and this is falling in IR, and this is observed by what? Passion. It's passion, right? And this falls in IR, infrared region. I'll tell you what it is, right? Uh, similarly, all the jumps to what? This is three, and similarly, all the jumps, you can actually see this way, and this falls in again IR, ag again IR, and this call, we call it to be bracket, and then we finally have the fund series, the fund series where the P is silent. You must understand. So you have basically one, two, three, four, and five. All the jumps to the first, all the jumps to the second, all the jumps to the third, all the jumps to the fourth, all the jumps to the five. You basically have five series. In fact, we have six series, which is, which is not, uh, uh, we don't discuss at this level. But understand that you have basically five series. And remember, the first series, commonly, it is falling in common region, that is ultraviolet region. And the second one is passion. And uh, sorry, so the second one is Bama, which falls in what? Visible region. The third one falls in IR. The, the fourth one also form for the bracket series also falls in IR. And the fifth one is a fund, which also falls in IR, infrared. Now, why the three infrareds? A student might ask a question. What is this three infrareds? Why all the three are infrareds? Remember one point. I draw the attention of everyone now. Now, observe. Infrared is actually basically divided into three parts. IR, and I can write it for you because this, this is a fundamental thing. And I wanted everyone to uh, look here. IR is basically divided into three parts. The entire spectrum of IR is divided into three parts. One I call near infrared. Then you have infrared. Then you have far infrared. So the IR is basically divided into three subdivisions. One I call the near infrared. The other is infrared. The other is a far infrared. So I can call this to be passion to be right. This is near infrared. This is infrared and that is far infrared, even though they are falling in the common region. But I think one is near, the other is infra, the other is what? Far infrared, you must understand that. Now, what is near infrared? Near to what? Near to your home? No, absolutely not. What is near infrared? Near infrared is all the region which is close to the visible region, which is close to the visible region which is closer to this visible region. Now look into this. this. Less than this is UV. Greater than that is what? IR. And all the lambdas which are closer to this visible region are called near infrared. Right? And all the lambdas which is far away from what? The visible region. And more, more towards the micro, right? The microwave region. Electromagnetic uh, spectrum, if you actually see to the extreme right, you have your micro uh, waves. And this uh, far infrared extends and merges with that. Right? So remember, as a fundamental thing, uh, you must be understanding the infrared is basically divided into near, Infrared and far infrared. Near infrared is that where the lambdas are close towards what? The visible. And then far infrared is that which is almost extending to the right in the electromagnetic spectrum, almost to the uh, microwaves. You must understand that, right? So anyway, you have five series. And five series, I have grouped it. And there is a basis for that. 
and all the jumps to the first are recorded as Lyman series and they fall in ultraviolet. All the jumps to the two are visible region and we call it to be Bama series and all the regions, uh, all the jumps uh, uh, to the three are nothing but what? Passion and which falls in near infrared and then you bracket which is again infrared and you have your fund series that also is what? Infrared. You must understand this and you must also have some knowledge about what? Near infrared and what? Far infrared which as I explained this to you right now that that's how the hydrogen spectrum looks like and remember two three questions which I would like wanted to highlight when any student looks at the picture they wanted to ask the teacher why are you so clumsy you're drawing man you don't have a parent scale of what why are you so clumsy in drawing all this it's not the question of being clumsy that's how it is that's how it is. And someone is asking you, how do you do that? Then I think you show the energy equation and you can see that the delta E is actually tending to zero. I'm not telling zero. You, if you actually see uh, through an electro, uh, you know, the magnetic spectra by splitting the lines, I think you can actually see even the merging has some energy level. It's close to zero, but I never said the delta E is zero. But for the observer, after seven, what happens is you have infinite number of energy levels. After seven, what happens is each energy level is basically merging with the other that's why off bar principle which you actually use it gets violated in some of the cases where when you frame the periodic table and that is violated that's one of the reasons which I'll come to that but as I mentioned I'm telling you that after 7 and 10 energy level the delta is so less that the hierarchy of the energies goes missing and all the laws get violated you must understand right so you have a clear spectra till 7 and after that there is a merging because delta E is tending to 0 now the question arises now the very question arises now you know you cannot just say all this and run away we need to prove it now remember when there is a jump from 7 to 10, now all these jumps not only that not only first if you see all these jumps all this jump the light is emitted and the question which is asked in the exam the question is asked which is asked in the exam is basically what if, he, if the light is emitted, he will ask you the lambda, the wavelength of the light. That itself is a question in the exam and you have so many transitions between the energy levels and each transition is having a specific lambda and the next question is how do you calculate that lambda and that's a question in your pre-engineering tests or pre-medical tests that we will be dealing with, right? And stay tuned and look here what I'm actually telling you, don't, don't deviate, watch carefully here, watch, watch, watch carefully here. Watch carefully. Now, 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 now I write in hydrogen spectra, in hydrogen spectra, in hydrogen spectra, each transition, each transition, when I say transition, it is a jump, gives out light, gives out light with specific lambda specific lambda that's wavelength and people will ask you how do you calculate that lambda you just cannot say story and run away from the room he will ask you he will ask you because light is coming out from the atom and I was claiming from the beginning that each transition will be having a different lambda and these are well-defined lines well-defined lines means the lambda is so specific to the decimals also so you must be in a position to calculate what is the lambda which is given out in all the transitions in the hydrogen spectra that might be a question right so what i will do hence i propose to you a, i propose to you a formula such that you will be in a position to calculate the lambda and the the, the formula is basically to calculate lambda to calculate lambda in each and every transition each and every transition each and every jump in the hydrogen spectra if you wanted to calculate lambda and I and here here comes the Rydberg's equation so use Rydberg's equation and what is the Rydberg's equation 1 by lambda is equal to r into 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square you must understand this is the equation where one is supposed to use to calculate the light which is emitted in any transition that happens within the atom within the atom because you must be vomiting that excess energy because you cannot bring in all your energy to, to the lower energy levels because the energy of the orbit is remain, remain, remaining constant. The intelligent factor is the way the Bohr has placed the sequence. 
the sequence of his postulate. First he says that energy of the orbit is constant and it's constant forever till we die. If that is the case, then if anyone wanted to revolve from higher to lower, it has to vomit that energy and vomit the energy in form of what? Light. And the light will have a having lambda. And you have so many transitions which I showed in the single electron system of hydrogen. And each lambda is calculated using Rydberg's equation. And that is 1 by lambda is r into 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square. You must understand where r, r is nothing but a constant that's nothing but Rydberg's constant whose value is 1096776767 inverse centimeters. You must understand 109677 uh, inverse what centimeters that is Rydberg's constant. You must understand that, right? What is N1? N1 is the energy level. Energy level, that is N2, is the another energy level you must understand. Suppose if an electron is jumping from N2 to N1. N2 to higher energy level is N2. The lower energy level is N1. Remember, 1 is a lower one and 2 is a higher one. So you must understand that is how we need to do it. Well, I would like to illustrate one point to you. One point to you. Let us take, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and people who are writing uh, their pre-engineering tests, I draw the attention of everyone here. Watch carefully here. What, what, what is asked in the exam is, suppose, suppose if I take the case of Lyman series. I want to illustrate this. Take the case of Lyman. When you take Lyman, it falls in ultraviolet region, right? And if I go for the pictorial representation, uh, otherwise it's simply 7 to 1, 6 to 1, 5 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1. So remember that all these are jumping toward the 1. And each jump is giving you what? A light. Now remember, someone is asking you, it's not jumping from 7, it is jumping from 8, it is jumping from 9, it is jumping to 10, from 10, 12, like that. And I was telling you, I was claiming you in the beginning itself that in an atom you have infinite energy levels. Infinite. Now someone is asking, what is the point? What is the limiting point? What is the limiting point of it? What is the highest energy level where the electron can get excited and then come back to a first energy level? Then remember, and it's a, since it has infinite, then what you do is, you substitute, you substitute N2 is equal to infinity. It's now jumping from infinity. Infinity is the highest energy level what we get it. And then it is jumping to N1 is equal to 1. After all, it is a Lyman series. It's a Lyman series. So if you substitute this, then in the Rydberg's equation, substitute this in what? The Rydberg's equation. Then if you actually see 1 by lambda is equal to R into R into 1 by N1 square, that is 1 square minus 1 by infinity square. Watch carefully here. If this is the case, then 1 by infinity would be 0. Right? And then 1 by lambda is equal to r, or lambda is equal to 1 by r. I think you will agree with me. And this is what, this is what is called the limiting lambda. That's a limiting point, or I call this to be a limiting lambda. And if I, if I actually wanted to define what is limiting lambda, limiting lambda is the smallest lambda. Because lambda and energy are inversely related. You must understand, E and lambda are inversely related. Smaller the lambda, smaller the lambda, more is the energy emitted. Because now the electron is in the highest orbit that is infinite. And from there it is jumping to the first. That will give you the maximum energy, maximum energy in form of light. And that light will have the smallest lambda. Because smallest the, smaller the lambda, more is the energy emitted. They are inversely related. You must recollect that basic equation which was told earlier to you. Right? So what is limiting lambda? Limiting lambda is the smallest lambda. When an electron is jumping from infinity to the first energy level, you must understand. In the exam, he has asked this question and I wanted to write this question for you. Look into this. Look into this question. And he is telling the limiting point, limiting point of Lyman is, limiting point of Lyman is, option 1, 1 by r, 
Option 2, 2 by R. Option 3, 3 by R. 4 by R. Of course, the answer is what? 1 by R. You must understand that. Similarly, for Bama, you need to substitute N2 is equal to infinity and N1 is equal to 2 and then find out how many R it is. Similarly, for passion, you need to substitute N, N2 is equal to infinity, N1 is equal to 3 and similarly so on for fund and bracket also. Then you will get limiting points for each and every 5 series which we proposed and that might be one question in exam. You must understand that. So, what are we doing here? Now, we, are, we have actually gone into the hydrogen spectra and we find so many transitions and each transition is giving out light and that light will be having lambda. You just cannot claim and run away. We require some, uh, you know, some mechanism to actually find out how much is the lambda and for that, I propose to you the Rydberg's equation, which is, uh, Rydberg's equation is basically used, basically used to calculate lambda in each and every transition in, in an atom. In an atom, not necessarily hydrogen atom, but any atom, you must understand. And this is Rydberg's equation, 1 by lambda is R into 1 by N1 square minus 1 by N2 square, you must understand. And the question which we'll be asking is the lowest lambda or the smallest lambda of each and every series. Each series has a limiting lambda. And limiting lambda is the smallest lambda of that particular series when an electron is jumping from infinity to 1 or infinity to 2, infinity to 3 or infinity to 4 or infinity to 5. And all the 5 series will be having the smallest lambda. You must understand that. Right. Well, once we finish this, what I will do, I want to place all formulae at one place, right, which gives us a little bit of confidence. What I will do is I'll put all the formulae at one place and you can actually note down all this. Watch here carefully. Till now what we have done, I'm putting all the formulae at one place and what exactly is this? Watch carefully. Watch. All formulae at one place, such that it will be a quick revision for you. It will be a quick revision for you and watch, and watch. And this is how it is. All formulae, all formulae and important points. Each one is a, not necessarily a formula. Even a theoretical question might be in the offing. So all formulae and important points at one place, at one place. And people who have missed out on this lecture, I think they can just concentrate on this piece of uh, uh, my discussion such that it will be a quick revision to you. Number one, number one, E is equal to H nu. This is depicting, this is depicting dual nature of light. Dual nature of light, you must understand that, right? And second, E is nothing but energy of one photon. You must understand. Energy of one photon is calculated by E is equal to H nu, where H is a Planck's constant whose value is 6.6 .6 into 10 power minus 27 ergs second. You must understand that. And where nu is a frequency. So if you wanted to calculate energy of one photon in the exam, right, you should use the formula E is equal to H nu, you must understand that, right? And the third one is, of course, the photoelectric equation. The photoelectric equation, which is H nu is equal to H nu naught plus half mv square. And the other versions of these are, I can write the further versions of it, where I call this to be E incident is equal to work function, work function plus kinetic energy. You must understand. That is the other version of what? The photoelectric equation. Proposed by what? Einstein. Then the third, fourth one, work function Work function is basically a function of size, you must understand. And work function is inversely related to size. So the smaller the size, the work function would be lesser. And this is the reason why 5, potassium, rubidium and cesium are used in photoelectric cells. 
only these three are the elements which are placed to the extreme left which have the work function least will be used in what photoelectric cells the other cells are uh, not useful because the work function is too high to remove the electron from the clutch of the nucleus you must understand that this is five and I continue writing all the formulae watch carefully here watch two important things right intensity in photoelectric effect in photoelectric effect please bank on this I want every student to bank on these two statements these two statements will be given in the exam and number one number one a uh, right a uh, right intensity intensity just increases number of photoelectrons that's all number of photoelectrons the second point I can rate kinetic energy of the photoelectron independent of K is independent of intensity you must understand this kinetic energy is independent of intensity intensity when increases the number of photoelectrons increase nothing more because all the photoelectrons will have the same kinetic energy and if you are interesting three and you remember that altering altering frequency of incident radiation incident radiation then kinetic energy alters you must understand this right I'm putting all the formula at one place for your quick understanding right and then four 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 remember remember this right and I can say velocity of the electron in the nth orbit velocity of electron in the nth orbit in the nth orbit you can have a formula where where vn is equal to v1 by n you must understand where where the velocity of electron in the first orbit is 2.18 into 10 power 8 centimeters per second it's so, so fast man the electron is so dynamic it is so dynamic you must understand when the electron is revolving in the first orbit look into the value 2.18 into 10 power 8 centimeters per second it's almost to the speed of light so electron is so dynamic to actually determine its exact position right you must understand it's so dynamic if you go to the second orbit the velocity actually falls to v1 by 2 if you actually see v2 is v1 by 2 v3 is v1 by 3 you must understand that so when you are actually going far away from the nucleus the potential energy is increasing so the kinetic energy basically what decreases that's what happens to you also so as the distance from the nucleus increases the velocity of the electron is basically falling right that is another question you must understand and then 5 5 remember that mvr the angular momentum is nh by 2 pi and this is basically condition it is a condition for electrons to revolve to revolve in a shell and if this condition is not met I think the electron will be kicked out of the atom and stopped from entering into the constitution of the atom you must understand that so MVR is equal to NH by 2 pi is basically what uh, a condition for uh, electrons to travel you must understand that and six I also told kinetic energy is nothing but an electron volt kinetic energy is nothing but what one electron volt so the, so what is an electron volt an electron volt is nothing but the kinetic energy experienced by the electron when moving through what a potential difference of one volt and that is how the electron volt is defined right and the seventh one if you wanted to calculate energy of a particular orbit this is minus 13.6 by n square or otherwise en is minus 2.17 into 10 power uh, minus right minus 11 ergs by n square or en is minus 2.17 2.179 into 10 power minus 18 by n square joules it's up to you which energy equation you wanted to use it right and that is in electron volts and this is in ergs this is in joules you can find out each and every energy uh, orbits energy because that remains constant that was the claim made by Bohr and here he has given the equation to calculate anything right and I, if I continue if I continue and I quote 
the Rydberg's equation to calculate lambda, I think 1 by lambda is R into 1 by n1 square minus 1 by n2 square. You must understand that is how to calculate the lambda in each and every transitions that happen in a hydrogen spectra. That is one equation. So what we have done uh, till date is E is equal to H nu. Just a quick revision of what we have done. E is equal to H nu. It depicts the dual nature of light. This cute equation is basically giving you uh, what? Uh, dual nature of light. And I would like to add something to this. This is extremely important. And remember that photoelectric effect is a proof that radiation is particle. And remember all this, diffraction, interference, interference or refraction or whatever, all these are proofs that light is a wave. You must understand this. So remember all these, you might be querying questions. Go through all this and there are some even banking questions in which you can actually bank upon. And remember, if anyone has missed the earlier lectures, he can actually go through a glance of what has been written here. Right, take a pause, take down in a white paper. That will be helpful in the subtopics what we have dealt till date. And in the next class, what we will do is, uh, we will go in for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle or the Schrodinger's wave equation or the Pauli's exclusion principle. And we'll link these three subtopics basically to what are the questions that are given in the exam in a much better way, in an exemplary way. And do join me for the next class. I'm sure you'll be doing it. And here, I, I Chandrasekhar Vodlamani, and I, I wanted everyone to actually subscribe to the tone Academy or the T1 channel and remember that even though you have your own teachers, respective teachers at schools, I think you can come home or anytime you can relax and have a revision of chemistry. Please bank on us. Please bank on Tone Academy. Thank you very much.